the Messic Church. Welcome. This is a video that has been long awaited with my husband Armando. Hello. <laughs> um, this is going to be a question and answer. I put out some stuff around Instagram, on YouTube community page, and Facebook, and I got lots of questions from you guys, mostly for him. So we're going to go ahead and get it started. Um, just to give you an idea of an outline, we have a background kind of on my husband and then how we met and our marriage. There's some home life questions and family questions and all that good stuff. So we're just going to get into it so it's not super long. And okay, so uh, the first question for background. So my name is Armando. I am her husband <laughs> and um, I'm glad to be here and hi to everyone who's watching. I guess I'm waving a lot there. <laughs> and um, I guess, well, we'll just kind of go through the questions here. And one of the questions is just regarding um, just kind of where I'm from. So I originally was born in Nicaragua. Chichialpa is a small little place by, um, I guess, uh, Managua, the, the bigger city there, the capital of Nicaragua. And um, during that time, I was about four years old and my family ended up moving to United States and mostly because there was a, a civil war, civil unrest between the Sandinistas and the Contras and um, they would kind of try to get young kids. I was a little bit too young to do this myself, but like my older brother, young kids to um, kind of join in the war. So they'll give them a gun to go fight and stuff. So my parents wanted nothing to do with that. So they decided to, to kind of move to United States. So um, that's the reason why we left. And, um, and that's why I'm here. Okay, so were you always Catholic? You know, this is an interesting question because my family in, in Nicaragua, um, almost a lot of people back then were Catholic and culturally that was part of, you know, kind of everything we did. So in a sense, yes, I was baptized Catholic. Um, but since I moved when I was really young, I didn't receive other sacraments like First Communion and Confirmation and I wouldn't until later on in my life. So. Um, I would say that yes, I was Catholic, but not fully in the Catholic, not fully with receiving the sacraments of the Catholic Church. And what was your faith journey like? And then also, this next one is, was there a turning point in your life that pushed you? So those could kind of be consolidated, I guess. So Yeah, so my faith, what was my faith journey like? I would say that um, I had very little experience with living my faith or knowing about my faith when I was younger. Um, some instances where um, I was taught some prayers by like my grandmother and maybe I saw a couple of people praying in my family, but it wasn't um, a lot. And I would probably add to that, that we probably attended mass maybe once or twice a year, maybe different celebrations throughout the year. So because of all that, and because I haven't, I hadn't received my sacraments when I was a kid, um, I didn't have a strong faith life. So as time went on um, and life went on, I would say that there are some turning points in my life where, you know, this time we were, we were married. And I guess the best way to say it without going into all these details is that um, a lot of baggage result that resulted from me living a certain lifestyle, I would call it maybe secular lifestyle. And me. Well, I both brought, of us. I a lot of yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, kind of came and affected our relationship, our marriage. And at that time, you know, Rihanna was somebody that I really dedicated my life to. And, you know, because we, we got married and, um, you know, we lived together and, and kind of moved away a little bit because I was in the military. Um, when when our relationship kind of suffered because of just both of our issues, um, that kind of sparked, I would say, my longing to get help in a sense, but to seek God in my life because I just kind of thought that maybe, um, you know, it was time for me to kind of change the way I was living. So I would say that that's probably the, 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 the point by where I became more engaged in the faith I wouldn't say my faith yet because that, that would take some time, but just in faith in general. So um, I would probably leave it there unless we come back to it. But. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So the next section is going to move into 
into like our marriage. So that was kind of the, the background and a bit of his background in his faith. So the first question in marriage is how did you meet? So we actually were invited to do a marriage talk a while back for, what was it called? Tap, uh, tap? What was it called? Uh, theology on Tap. Theology on Tap. Yeah. And, um, and that was really fun. We had like the baby with us. But anyway, so how did you meet? So I guess that's something we could both. Well, I guess we have two different perspectives here, but yeah. um, when I think we, I, I was maybe what, 15? No, you were, you were 16. You were, you were 16. 16. Because I had just turned 16. Okay. So you had it. So we were both 16, apparently. <laughs> and um, at that time, I had come across, uh, what do you call him? A, a, not a bar owner, but he like was a like a club like owner. owner. Yeah, a club owner. And my they lifestyle had, was way different. And but they had like youth clubs. Did they? In, I think this was just like a regular, like a regular. club. I think, uh, to be honest, I think you had to be like, like 21. Thinking, you know? Anyway. <laughs> Asking you guys. <laughs> so he kind of um, recruited me specifically to go down the beach and uh, and and um, distribute flyers about this club that was opening. And he kind of told me that, uh, you know, you'll, you, you'll get VIP status, you'll get to go in, blah, 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 blah. So I kind of recruited a couple of friends to go down the beach and that's what we were doing. So we started maybe a couple miles down from where we would encounter <laughs> each other, but I'm um, just handing out flyers. And I was with somebody uh, uh, that she knew and, and some other friends from high school. Anyway, so I come to ba basically the the, um, the pier <laughs> and I see, from my perspective, I see um, two girls, um, you know, near the water. And one of them is standing up, kind of like bathing herself with suntan lotion. <laughs> And I, I mean, sunscreen. sunscreen, it was white, yeah, 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 it was that's really right. yeah, white. Yeah, <laughs> and and you said something, I, I probably at this moment I can't remember, but you said something. And when I saw you, I thought, oh, she's so into herself, you know. <laughs> and I was really kind of turned off in a sense because it's like, it's like, you know, probably high maintenance. I don't know. <laughs> so when I saw him coming, I thought, oh, he's like, you know, he's good looking. And in my mind, I thought, oh, I'm gonna try to like, make him laugh and like had like an icebreaker so i took a really white sunscreen and i was rubbing it on my face i'm like oh i'm so gorgeous because in my mind that was a really great idea <laughs> and then, but it didn't it no. didn't compute or whatever it just made me sad yeah. <laughs> but it was really white i looked yeah. crazy it wasn't like self-absorption yeah. and, and that was just the beginning so yeah <laughs> but then a friend of ours mutual friend uh went over there to talk with them and um she he came back and he said he made a comment about what she said about me. I was and, like, oh, he's cute. Yeah, Who so he ended up tell, telling me that. So I was kind of, I, I, I was interested in a sense, you know, <laughs> but I didn't know what to do. So um, I think that's about the only thing that took place at that first encounter. And then towards the end of that day, I went around and we were just kind of a communal place in, by the pier. And I'm kind of standing off to the side. And, and here comes Rhiannon, you know, I, I'm not sure if you had a tower or... I, no, I don't know. If, I just had a bathing suit. Yeah, it was not I modest. Guess, yeah. <laughs> but I didn't, we was a beach sign. I didn't know anything about modesty back then. So anyway, so she's, she's, she's there. And then what do you say? I was, uh, my friend, our mutual friend and another guy, they were talking to me and my friend. And I really wanted to talk to him. And he was like standing back. And so then I said... What do you think you're too good for me? And he was like, "What?" <laughs> so you could see the the miscommunication started from the moment we met. So, um, but even though that kind of, you know, how we that's how we met, <laughs> I would say I was still kind of interested, you know, in her, and um, she was op obviously a little her temperament was a little bit different than mine. So <laughs> I think that's kind of what attracted me to her. But um all right so that's how we met so then the next one is how did you discern your vocation to marry each other so now i was not catholic at this point um you had obviously catholic influences you were raised for a certain portion so i didn't even, i didn't even learn about discernment of vocations until like I don't know, like 22 years, like when we had our first baby, I was pregnant with our first child. Um, and so I guess it was a very, more for me, I guess you could say like a secular <laughs> discernment. I don't know. I mean, you might've had more to go on. Yeah, well, I, I, don't know. I don't know if I would call it a discernment. It was, it was a form of discernment, but I think for me was that, so, uh, so we were dating. When I started to kind of think about my future, you know, after high school, because I was getting close to graduating, um, I really kind of thought about, you know, would she be somebody who 
I wanted to commit my life to somebody that, um, well, first I would have to ask her, right? But, <laughs> but then um, somebody that I felt comfortable, um, you know, asking to marry me. And I thought about it for some time and I kind of had some ideas throughout the times we were dating, but, um, you know, I would say that on, on my part, that when I committed to um, asking her to marry me, um, it wasn't it was an honest this, um, commitment, you know, to, to us. Even though we were, we were really young, I would say it was an honest de decision to wanting to be together for you know for the rest of our lives. So at least you know, in my mind, yeah, that's yeah. kind of what was going on. So. And then for me, I had a lot, and I know I've shared on this channel before, if you've been with us, been, me, been with me for a while, that I've shared a lot about like the toxic feminist stuff that I really got from the culture and I grew up with. So uh, my discernment process was really challenging because everything, the culture was like, you know, you know, don't marry young, go for career, like um, be independent. And, but inside I, I, I wanted something different. And, um, and I knew that he had values that I, I valued. Like I really appreciated things that he cared about. So did you discern yeah. to marry? I did. How did you discern to marry? You know, you gotta, well, for me it's so know. long. It's know, not like this quick, you're so good. Question, for the sake of the question. So sake of the question, like um, I did discern and it was just, I had a lot of voices around me that were like, you know, oh, you're so young, oh, blah. and I had to just kind of push through that and say, this is what I'm going to choose to do. I'm going to choose to marry him and, you know, try to make this work, but I had no picture, I guess what I'm trying to say, of what that would look like. And so that was what was challenging for me. <laughs> That's the hard question, but for the sake of this. Okay. Next <laughs> so, question. Okay. What does a Catholic family marriage vocation mean to you? So this is for both of us, right? Yeah. I feel like I should do that one over again. No, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> what does the Catholic family or marriage vocation mean to you? Well, um, like I said, I didn't really understand what vocation was until later. So originally it was, you know, um, very worldly. Now it's about, I really want to help get him to heaven. And I want to have a life with him here that is, is loving and righteous and leading our children to Christ. Um, so I would say for me, um, you know, I, I, I studied theology and I would say that, um, you know, I kind of spend a lot of time in looking into, you know, I don't know, the documents about Catholic marriage, family and, and marriage and vocation. And, um, and I, I, I mean, I could say any, anything regarding that, but I think that on, on, a, on a more simple level, in a sense, um, for me now, I would say that just seeing our family come together and be healthy, be um, ex express love, you know, through both in our, you know, um, the spousal love, but also like the love with our kids and the kids within themselves. So I would say just on a very simple practical level, um, I've gotten to the point where I just kind of appreciate just that aspect of, of being together as a family and just being grateful that we all of us are Catholic. So um, I would say that that's, that's important. Um, but if you wanted to kind of go into like all the <laughs> high theology stuff, you could probably describe that too. But um, I, I, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Okay, what is the best marriage advice you received thus far? Okay, so mine sounds really funny, but with the whole feminist thing, my Titus two women that I shared a lot about <coughs> in this channel, when uh, we had been married for a few years and I was sitting in her little kitchen, I was just like probing her brain because she was the first Catholic woman that I had really been around that had a life that I, it looked like I wanted to live about um, being a good wife. She told me two things. She said, one, really try to hear what the Lord is saying to you through your husband and try very hard to not look through kind of the veil of the culture that, that men are two things, stupid and carnal. And I know that sounds horrible, but that's what the culture really teaches so many women about men. And so when she said those things to me, it helped me to stop viewing my husband through those, that lens and really hear him for who he was and also what God was saying to him as the head of our family. I think for me, the, the best advice is not one specific advice, or rather there are a lot of advices. <laughs> um, and well, partly it may have 
do maybe we do to the fact that um, we had so many issues in the past, you know, so, you know, the, just the idea of learning how to communicate better, yeah. you know, learning about each other, about myself, about her, about, you know, how we, our relationship is, um, learning how to love in small ways and, and that type of thing. Um, so I'd say I, I don't, I don't necessarily pinpoint it to one specific thing. Um, cause I really appreciate, and I could see the need for all these things to be able to cultivate a healthy relationship, a marriage relationship. So, um, I, I guess the second question is kind of tied to that. And the question is, uh, what is your favorite memory together? So I think that now, again, it's a hard one. Well, there's no, so many, like, there's well, so but many. Well, that's, that's, that's what I'm going to say. So it's like, it's not so much about one specific memory, but I think that like the way I would describe it is all the memories when like time kind of slows down and we just kind of appreciate each other as a family. You know, whether it be, you know, with, with her or with the kids, you know, together. Um, you know, I think we went on a date here several weeks ago. My mom comes to town every like six months and then we, we go on a date. like two dates a year. You know? <laughs> so anyway. Thanks, mom. Yeah, yeah. sorry. So, um, you know, and, and, you know, time slowed down there. We just, you know, we had maybe 30 minutes or I don't know how long the, the dinner was. But, you know, we just kind of appreciated each other, you know. Mm -hmm. And we can point to many, many times throughout, you know, in the past where, times did slow down time in Lenore you know and we lived in a small cabin you know just those are, I think those are my favorite memories so it's it's just when we kind of when things slow down around us and we're able to kind of appreciate each other yeah. <laughs> okay so then the next one is okay now I'm not trying not to smile a lot but what are different ways he feels supported by you I mean, big impact things and low impact things <laughs> so um, I would some of the things that I would say is, you know, just your temperament, I guess, with, you know, just being so encouraging, you know, and any, any affirmation of her is going to have her blood. So anyway, just being encouraging, um, you know, and kind of building me up, you know, because there are certain times where, you know, sometimes I doubt, you know, the certain things I could do. I mean, internally, I have this kind of motivation to do things, but, you know, sometimes things don't go your way and just to be able to have the support. I think that's very that's very um, um, helpful. Uh, I would say overall, she's always very positive. So even even if I don't do something that I you know probably well, I mean by well I mean like let's say I was Perfect. upset <laughs> for something, you know she's always going to try to seek the best version of myself, and she would try to affirm that, and and I think that's kind of helpful because sometimes you may feel bad like oh I shouldn't have been upset, you know. But um, but she's not kind of looking at that so much or thinking about that so much. Um, and little things, you know, just her willingness to want want to do everything, create a better experience for all of us, you know, for, for me and for the kids in our home. And, um, okay, go, come on, because you're not, you're not going to make it through this. I'm sorry. What does your wife do for your family that you are grateful for and really appreciate? I think I just said it, you know, it's just all the support she offers all of us. And, you know, she's, she's a tireless worker and, and. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to have to move on. I'm sorry. So, okay, okay. But anyway, but it's, it's good support. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Home life. <laughs> what makes your home Catholic? Uh, for example, things, schedules, rules, not just material items. And these, this question is for both of us. Sure. So maybe you should, I mean, you want me to go first or do you want to say what you feel? I mean, I think like we try to um, celebrate feast days, even if it's just really small with a couple cupcakes and like a little show or a book about the saints. <coughs> um, they're so heroic in the faith and it's important, I think, for kids to know that that exists. And, um, and then with rules, I guess I try to create kind of a rhythm of our life. And when I can, I try to bring in a three o'clock Divine Mercy Chaplet with some of the kids or when we're driving to pick up kids from school to do that. Um, just when I'm doing the dishes at night, I play the rosary on YouTube while I'm doing it so it can be heard throughout the home. If like we don't sit down to a rosary and, okay buddy. Um, and things like that, rules, I don't think we're real big rule people. It's kind of like knowing our kids, knowing their hearts um, and teaching them the faith, so. So, you know, I think for, for me, 
it's really important to to not i mean the the external things are very are very helpful you know um but the internal things are the ones that i focus on a lot for myself and for our family um so you know virtue is very important for me um you know so anything that is and i guess i'm gonna call it the evangelical life so things that are you know expressions of mercy and you know love and forgiveness and and you know you know just anything you can think of scripturally what god has revealed and these type of things are important for me and i think our kids understand that because they know that if we if i or Rhiannon or any of the kids fail to live up to the call the, you know the gospel call the evangelical call um they know that i'm going to say something so that's important for me so in the rules to me you know i i, I seldom will talk about rules but i'm going to talk about virtue so if virtue if you're failing in, in virtue then um you may get a couple of rules not necessarily for the rules sake but because you, you're failing in virtue yeah it helps it helps yeah. them to know like where like like how to get there yeah. and how to like um the steps the practical how to's of getting to that virtue and he's good about bringing those things up i think in addition to that i would say that um just for my my own personal life of discovering who, who jesus is i mean that's kind of what has been my, my faith journey and then handing that over to our kids as well you know from from the perspective of a dad just to be able to say like you know let's discover who jesus is you know for for our sake um and i think that ultimately that's more important to me than than the other external things that that are helpful um but they're they're expressions of the internal life okay, so yeah. yeah and then how was it making ca the catholic okay how was it making catholic faith choices and changes in everyday life such as routines holidays and marriage that's kind of i mean it's um <coughs> so maybe it's deep and broad <laughs> I, I think i think this is okay so the way i can describe this response to this question is that i kind of look back because it's our everyday life now so it's this is so it's I guess just infused we, in our yeah exactly so we were in the question is you know how was it making the catholic faith choices and changes in everyday lives such as marriage routines and all that stuff how does how, what how was that in through that process well yeah. our life is that now but i would say that there was a time where it wasn't for even for both of us you know together in, in our lives so i would say that at that point i i did see a difference um i did see where i had to choose to wanting to do things for God versus either for myself or kind of worldly, um, you know, kind of secular in a sense without God. Um, and I would see the, the differences, you know, um, some of the things that on a personal level, when I went through a transition or a conversion, you know, people around me initially kind of doubted these, these changes because they say, well, I know you like, like you didn't behave this way before and then now you're like you know time. now you're you're this pious person and i have to be around you know that finger pointing so i kind of went through that process um i'm way at a different stage now in my life than back then um but that's a hard stage but yeah. i could see i could see the the um the challenges of doing that mm -hmm. i would say <laughs> from <laughs> <laughs> from a practical um standpoint too like this is silly but one um, um i started making feast day cakes like years ago and i tried to make them really pretty and happy and trying to bring the faith in a fun way um and that was when i just didn't i think have a lot of internal so i tried to make it like external more and then it slowly became that was like really practical and another thing that just popped in my head and i wanted to say it was don't ask your husband to pick up dinner always make dinner and then this isn't necessarily catholic but this was something that i feel like was helpful that when he offers it then it's like this joyful thing rather than this like i can't do it tonight i'm just so tired so i really tried like little ways like that and like making like 
and that, that sounds kind of silly, but making meals like every day and making a meal plan. So then when he came and like said, hey, I wanna take you guys out to dinner, then it was like this fun, exciting thing. And that might not really sound like, like a Catholic thing, but I feel like with routines and even with marriage, appreciating like the income that he makes, appreciating the way that he's blessing our family and not just expecting, expecting. So I just wanted to say that too. Okay, this is for you. So did he agree with you becoming a homemaker? What does he think about homemakers and stay-at-home moms? So I grew up with homemakers in a sense. Like my grandmother obviously um, retired. Um, my mom, she worked, but she did a lot of stuff at home. You know, she all had the, to work. Yeah, she yeah. had to work so. and, and these type of things. So I don't know if I would say like, okay, that's what I was looking for, you know, in a spouse when I grew up. But I would say that the main thing that I could pinpoint and say, how do I feel about this, is the fact that she was interested in doing this. So I kind of supported her in, in that part. And for me, that meant that I needed to try to, you know, create the income and try to, you know, live a certain life to, to be able to sustain that type of lifestyle. So it really necessarily, it wasn't necessarily what I was pursuing but I pursued it when she said that that's what she wanted to do. So it was more of a support than, mm -hmm. than anything else. And I will say with that, and, and go, go. but it says, what what does he think about yeah, homemakers yeah. <laughs> stay at home moms? Um, I think, what do you think about that? Yeah, well, <laughs> that sounds funny. I don't want to offend anyone because I'll just, probably, you know, there's yeah. gonna be a lot of home stay at home moms. So yeah. I gotta be careful what I say. Yeah, yeah, no. no. <laughs> I think, I think, um, I think there's a great, there's a great honor in that. Um, I think that the challenge is you know, per family, because if she wanted to do that, but yet I wasn't interested in doing that myself, or, you know, we didn't have the means to do that. Um, and we didn't want to make the, the lifestyle to do that. It'll be, it would have been very challenging, you know, on, on everyone. Yeah. So I think that because I was committed to her and what she was wanting to do, and I was, I was fine with it and I was okay with it and supporting her. Um, and see the benefits of it because you know our our kids are just wonderful kids you know and there's a time where they're going to transition out of the home life in a sense and go to school and eventually move on but um, but I'm very supportive as long as it's fitting for your family so yeah and I do want to say I made a video before about being a stay-at-home wife I was a stay-at-home wife before we had children for a very short amount of time but that was also because like there was some healing that needed to happen and I just needed to get away from the world. I just really, so I, I asked, we, we cut back a lot. We made a lot of big changes. Um, and so, yeah, but um, I just wanted to add that too because I know people have asked me that question. So the next one, this next section is about your spiritual life and there it's mostly for sure. you. So what does your spiritual routine look like? Do you go to holy hour? Um, how do you lead your family in prayer? Yeah, they don't so, have holy hour here, do they? And it's like every Friday. Yeah, once a so month. <laughs> this is this is a, a good question, but I don't know if it's um my response is is ordinary because you know I work for the church, um, I'm involved with all kinds of pastoral leaders, you know, pastors, DREs, any faith formation leaders on a daily basis. Um, I'm I'm always either doing a talk or a retreat or these type of things. So I'm highly involved in, in these things. And, um, you know, that does affect my spiritual life. Um, on a very simple basis, you know, just, uh, you know, daily prayers in the morning. I used to say the divine office, and I probably need to get doing that again. Um, I, I would also um, quite intensely pray the rosary. And I, I want to kind of do that again. But I actually want to try doing it in Spanish. So okay. I... I um, my, my Spanish prayers are not too refined, so I kind of want to do that. Anyway, and, um, you know, we kind of encourage our bishop to um, bring a tabernacle and, and, uh, and Jesus to our, to our office. So, um, you know, we, we, for the last month, it's probably taken like two months to do it just because we're so, we're so busy, but we've been doing the, the visitations of Blessed, um, of not Blessed, uh, St. Alphonsus Liguori. Okay. And um, very beautiful, beautiful devotion. I did it with a group. So we had, well, the times that I was there during three o'clock, we had our visitations. We also would pray um, the the um, Divine Mercy, or we pray the Divine Mercy. There's a lot of prayer in the office, so it's it's highly prayerful experience. A lot of sacramental experiences, a lot of spiritual experiences. That's not common. <laughs> 
you know, um, so I would say that all that influences my spiritual life. So I'm, I'm quite content where I'm at spiritually. I think my relationship with, with God has is, is kind of where I would hope my spiritual life to be and my relationship with God to be. Obviously, there's a lot more to, to, to learn and to, to develop in my relationship, but I'm, I'm pretty I'm content where, where, where my spiritual life is in, in a sense of not being complacent, but just just finding peace where I'm at and, and continue to grow from there. Yeah. And then Holy Hour, how do you lead your family in prayer? Um, so I think... You do that stuff with our oldest. Well, that's actually another that? question, so we'll wait for that because they ask about a son later on. Oh, okay. But, you, know. Um, you know, we can always get better at praying as a family. Um, I know my prayers used to... My, my individual prayers used to kind of uh, influence... Our, our family prayer because we'd go with him he would do a rosary and we'd go out and do they'd have like a station of the cross and he would pray you know yeah i, I would say that as a family you know we, there's always room for improvement um i would say in addition to that too though that even though prayer is not as strong um sharing the faith probably is stronger and so, your life is i have to say you, his life is a prayer as well, because um, everything like you talk about with virtue and how he speaks to their children and how he does things in our home and how he, you know, so um, I feel like there is an active living prayer that happens within the home. Yeah, and I guess I, uh, just to describe a little bit further is that we can be, I can be more intentional. We as a family can be more intentional about saying, um, you know, vocal prayers together, you know, and that type of thing. But but we, I am intentional. We are intentional about being vocal and sharing our faith mm -hmm. and our relationship with with christ so that in itself is a prayer but i'm not seeing it i'm not classifying as a prayer in a sense but like you know i remember you know we did this kind of program together you know i, I don't know if that's eventually going to go to well, another question but okay. i'm just going to mention it here so um we would um do a program and we're still in the process of finishing it but there was a time where it's, it was supposed to be a retreat where the group of people you know a group of kids but it was just me and our <laughs> oldest. And, um, and there was a point where we just kind of invited the Holy Spirit into his life, you know. And, you know, typically that happens at a retreat or something. And, and it's just basically me and him sitting down on the couch and inviting the Holy Spirit into his heart, you know. Which was kind of like, it was, it was a little challenging for me at first because, you know, it's not something you normally do with your kids. But it was rewarding, obviously, with the graces that were provided. And I could see the growth in him you know, um, as just his own personal life and prayer. So, um, so I would say that maybe just to conclude it here, um, I tend to be very detailed as you notice, but, um, <laughs> though, is that, you know? is that like, I maybe don't at this point really focus on the like structure of prayer, but the, the, the internal disposition for prayer, I do focus on and, and I'm intentional about that. And then someone asked, um, extraordinary versus ordinary. So which mass? Oh, okay. So this tends to be a hot topic. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to say this. Um, both and. <laughs> just, just to be clear. And I want to describe it a little bit further because I know that this tends to be discussed a lot. So um, let me start from kind of like the, the negative side of things. So obviously... The association with the ordinary form that sometimes is not as reverent. Sometimes it's a little um, just disconnected in a sense, and 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 how we should honor and worship God. Um, but what I've found is that in the ordinary form is that if I try to understand the liturgy better understand certain aspects of the liturgy and enter into that mystery more then I get more out of it okay so meaning that um, consecration happens in any form um, and our response to Jesus on the altar really um, could impact how we understand the liturgy as well so maybe I'm being a little bit too nebulous here but in other words, even traditionally, the church has described this what um, this this 
process of the disposition to receive a sacrament or just the mass to partake of the mass. So um, the ordinary form, you know, um, has a great potential to to bring us into the mystery of Christ. On the other side, the extraordinary form sometimes lends itself to these higher mysteries because it focuses on like sacrifice and kind of putting the focus to to these um, very um, kind of powerful moments. And I appreciate it. You know, I appreciate the extraordinary form as well. Um, on the downside of the extraordinary form, I would say, is that not, not so much about the extraordinary form, but about the, the devotion to the extraordinary form, meaning that um, if we become too narrow in our focus, saying like, this is the only way, um, that is when I kind of back away from the conversation and say like, I don't necessarily agree with that. So, you know, I'll give you a quick illustration of both of these. So obviously, um, just imagine a Eucharistic adoration with extraordinary um, elements, meaning that, you know, a high altar, uh, maybe Gregorian chant, um, incense, and these type of things. And um, it's quite beautiful, right? It kind of brings you into that mystery. Um, and then to, sit, to think that that's really the only way, um, I wouldn't agree with that because I have had very profound moments with um, an altar made of a table with an altar cloth and um, uh, just a monstrance with two candles on the side and a little bit of contemporary, you know, praise and worship music and silence, you know, in community. And, and, in, and in, in the context, obviously we see a huge difference here, but, um, but they're both sacred. They're both very profound. So obviously each have their own elements, but um, that's how, how I feel overall, is just seeing that if we seek the best out of any mass, we have the ability to understand the beauty and the mystery that, that's in, in front of us um, and not necessarily just kind of focus on one, so. Okay, and the next um, group of questions is for family life. So how do you both, as a couple, instill the Catholic faith in your children? Have you both found it challenging <laughs> given the times that we live in? I feel like we've answered the first portion. How do we like instill the Catholic faith? Well, I guess, I mean, we do, sure. I mean, I think, yeah. I mean, we also do like whenever it's sacramental year, like for first confession, first communion, um, Armando does like a special thing with them, um, like with the little colors, like thing. And then like uh, we do a lot of talking in the house. I go over catechism. We usually read through the children's Bible together that year, so the child has a good idea of like salvation history and stuff. Um, and then do we cha do we find it challenging given times that we live in? It it is kind of challenging, but I feel like everything has we can pull from anything. I mean, not anything, but yeah, you know, like. You know, and I apologize to those who are probably going to be listening to me say a lot of things because it's it's a lot to talk, kind of describe here and my thoughts. But um, um, if you appreciate all the details, you know, thank you, I guess. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I think that I kind of want to respond a little bit more to this question because it's this is very important, I think, to me and, and kind of where we're at and the generation that we're, we're living in. And it's, it's obviously very challenging, obviously very challenging because of just the path that society is at. Um, so I, I kind of want to start there. But at the same time, um, I would also add that there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of um, graces. You know, St. Paul would say, uh, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. You know, and I truly believe that. So I think there's a lot of grace that God wants to bestow on those who want to listen, those who want to kind of get engaged. And um, and um, I would I kind of want to want to reference here one of the things that I learned from studying Vatican II. And you know, Vatican II was kind of a, they call it a watershed moment in the in the church, where you know prior to Vatic to the Vatic you know, Second Vatican Council. Um, things were a little bit more closed in a sense. We weren't really as engaged as a whole in society. And um, there was a joke that said, uh, you know, Vatican II opened the doors to the church and everybody left, you know. And, um, but anyway, um, the, 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 the idea kind of that I want to kind of talk about is this idea of finding the seed of the gospel in culture. 
meaning that um, there's a lot of good things that we can find that are in its seed form. And then our responsibility, our call, is to really to, to cultivate that seed, to grow to the point where it can be um, an expression of the gospel life. So because I view it that way, um, I see a lot of things, obviously, that are challenging, but I also see things that, you know, could benefit from our cultivation and um, benefit from our witness. And, you know, in addition to this, I would also add that there, it requires a, a true, you know, the term that is used in the Bible is, is metanoia, this changing of mind. Um, if you recall, um, if you ever read the Acts of the Apostles, you know, there were times where like Peter and John would go out and they would proclaim, you know, the gospel and, um, and then they would get in trouble, you know, they'll, they'll put them in prison and then they'll get hit and whipped and all these things. And it's kind of odd because after they were, they're released, it says they rejoiced because of suffering for the sake of the gospel. And they were kind of like leave for joy and kind of go marrying, you know, um, back into their homes. And it's quite interesting because it's like, okay, so you just got beat in a sense, you know, got hit by the, the uh, guards or whatever. And then you're like happy, you know, you're finding joy. So that is an example of metanoia. That's an example of the change of mind. So even though things, things are challenging, can we get to the point in our spiritual lives where metanoia actually takes place in ourselves? And then things around you are seen from a different perspective. And I'd say that, you know, I believe that's where I'm at. I think that's where most of us, you know, here are at. And um, so we, we, it's not like evil and good and that type of thing. So, Okay. And then, um, okay, this is for you. How can fathers help their sons to believe and or deepen their faith? You know, it's, 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 it's a little... I, I believe it's a simple answer to some degree, but it's very challenging to do. And the best thing a father can do to help their sons, especially depending on kind of what age. So if you have small children, you know, you, you, you kind of witness to your faith life and you, you witness to, you know, just love and mercy and virtue and these type of things. And the kids want to kind of model that to see you as like a, you know, a, a, you know, a hero, hero. Yeah. And, and these type of things. But there's a there's a point in time where those kids become teenagers, and um, you know, along with being a teenager, is the questioning of. And we have a teenager now. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> which is a blessing. Yeah. Questioning of life, questioning of you know friends. And those and are good things, you know, to question and, and these type of things. So. I think that at that point, you want to share the faith. You want to, what I would say is repropose the faith. But you want to focus on the essential things, like this question of who is Jesus? You know, let's, let's discover that together. You know, you're no longer here as a teacher with your pupil, in a sense, and, and instructing these kids. Now you're like someone along the way, someone along the journey. And you're, you're reproposing to them. Uh, which is kind of similar to what you do with adults, but you're reproposing to them the faith, but more specifically the essential things of the faith, like who is Jesus, as a starting point, you know, um, and helping them develop their relationship with God, and um, and then starting to kind of go from there. Okay, like okay, what does our sexuality look like in in the eyes of of Christ? You know, what social justice look in the eyes of God? You know, and that type of thing. But um, but that requires more of a mentorship in a sense, you know, someone who's involved with them. And it's not, there's a lot of freedom involved in a sense is that you do respect their doubts and, and these type of things. Um, to me, that is the best approach, um, which can be simplified, but could be challenging because we're not used to doing that, so... And then um, someone asked, why not homeschool all your children? So this is for both of us. So we home, I homeschooled them all the way, uh, my, our oldest, he, I homeschooled him through sixth grade. And then he started at our local Catholic school part-time in seventh grade. And then now he's going full-time in eighth grade. And then our daughter, who is 11, just started <clears throat> part-time in sixth grade at the local Catholic school. Um, 
So I know for me, I, I got to a point where I just felt really stressed and concerned about um, being able to get them all out to like socialize and not that socialization is the only thing, but like get out and go to programs and do things when I had all the kids, it was kind of challenging. So I just got to a place where I knew that something needed to change. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the way I see it is um, just my perspective of faith and life um, with our involvement in their lives um, my involvement in the school, in a sense, you know, because I've been exposed to the school quite a bit. And with him working for the diocese. Yeah, so, you know, knowing some And of it's those, a small school. It's a small school. And just being around it, just seeing, you know, it's a good school. It's a good school. Um, where we're at, it might not be the same in other places, but where we're at, um, it's, it's very fitting. I think that, you know, with Rianne, and I even saw it myself that, you know, the kids could have benefited more from being in a school um, at that age level there. And um, I think that the younger kids are just enjoying themselves here. Um, but once you get to a certain age level for us, it, it seems like it was the best option or the better option, I would say. Yeah. Um, I'm not too worried. I mean, there's gonna, there's, there are issues out there, mm -hmm. but our kids have, have so all the, all the work we've put into our kids and all the things that we kind of talked about, you see the fruit in their everyday life. Yeah. You know, how they stand up for, for, for people that are, you know, being bullied sometimes or, um, you know, or choose the right choices rather than, you know, the bad choices and kind of, you know, remove themselves from certain situations. And, you know, I'm just amazed how supporting, supporting people are, are you know, so here's an example. So our, our son is, is uh, in the basketball league um, and, I went, you know, we had a, a, a volleyball tournament today and we were going to go to the volleyball tournament, but I stopped by just checking um, our son out, you know, in his in basketball just to see how he's improving. And at the end of it, I heard one of the coaches say, you know, I mean, maybe other people get offended by this, but I heard other, other people say, I, I'd rather have a hundred, our son's name, you know, insert our son's name, than like all these good players because... Like he really gives all he, you know, all the effort and he's there and he's fighting and he's pushing. And that comes from our conversations here. That comes from me helping him out, working with him and these type of things. And, and it's like, these are the coaches saying this. this is not the first time, you know, his football coaches said the same thing, you know? So it's like, he's, he's choosing the, the road that sometimes is a little bit challenging, but it's, you know, virtuous, it's, you know, all Shut these, all, all these, all these little things. And I, I could tell you this, that was not the case maybe about a year ago. There was times where he just didn't really care about yeah. a lot of things, about almost anything. Emotionally. When he was homeschooling, yeah. When yeah. at the end, it was, it was getting to the point where I felt like, you know, I always told myself I wanted to homeschool all the way through, but I also wanted to do the best thing as a mother for our children. And I knew at that time it personally, it wasn't the best thing. It would have been following a dream that I had, but I needed to pay attention as a mother of what would have been good for these particular children, the older children. And, um, and also it's really, like he said, it really pertains to where we are too. It's a, it's a good school. It's small, the area we live in, he works closely with it. And, and our family, you know, that yeah. makes a difference too. Yeah. So we, we have absolutely no um, regret. Yeah. We don't feel like we're you know, sliding our kids at all. Um, I think it's challenging for them, and we kind of navigate this life with them. And if it got to a point where, obviously, like it, it starts to boil over, yeah, then, and then they, they would always come home. Yeah, like, I'm that, always that's not, here. Yeah. That's not closed off to them. Right. But And they know that, which I think helps them feel a little bit more free and not so like this is all there is. And um, so that's nice, too, having that. Yeah, and I, but I think where we are currently in our state, right in our life right now, this is the better option. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then let's see. All right, we're almost done. So now we have just a few more questions, and this section is about large family, and they're for you. So as the head of a larger family, what advice would you give a wife who would like to encourage more of a leadership role in the family for her husband? And she also wants to hear my thoughts on that too. Um, well, God bless you if you've lasted this long. Um, it's probably, I don't even know how long this has probably been, like two hours or whatever. <laughs> um, it's a long video. Yeah. Uh, but a good one. 
but I, but I think so. Let me share a couple of thoughts regarding this. Right. Especially if the dynamics are that maybe uh, she has been more of the leader, or like, because I know a lot of women have reached out to me about sure. that before, and now they're wanting, <clears throat> really, they're wanting their husband to take more of that role, but it's never been that way, and they don't know how to do that as a Christian woman, you know, yeah. some from a man's perspective. Yeah, and I guess what I'm about to say is there's not a one size fits all. You know, different men react differently to yeah. different women, you know, so sometimes, you know, just basically telling them, hey, you know, you better take on your, your leadership role. You know, maybe that would work for some. And for others. Some, it would be the wrong thing to say. Yeah. You know, um, I think I think that one thing that would stand out to me, and I was trying to kind of describe this to Rhiannon as well, is that like always wanting to seek the best and in a, in a sense expect the best out of your husband um, and to know that you're... You're, you're wanting him to get better, you know, and you're, you're hoping for him to get better and that he sometimes, you know, hopefully he can recognize that, you know, I don't know how you would communicate that, but, um, but the idea is that, you know, you see things in him that are his best qualities, things that he can, he can really shine. Areas he could lead through. Yeah, areas, areas where yeah. he could, he could lead through. Um, even though he doesn't see it in himself, you know, but things that are evident to you, you would know your husband specifically, you know, and, and these type of things. So I think that um, that's very important, you know, because it's not like you ca you're calling him out, but you're in a sense like, you know, you're, you're almost anticipating that he's going to strengthen those things that are, are good qualities in him. And, you know, and he probably, in a, in a sense, intuitively recognizes that sometimes fails to live up to that, but to know that somebody else is there holding him accountable or in a sense, you know, hoping that he attains that, um, never lose sight of that. I think that's a very important thing. Um, I think even like when it relates to the kids as well, um, there's some, there's, it's very similar to where like, you know, you can criticize a child in a sense and you could say like, stop doing that, you're, you know, terrible at doing that. And that's really hard for them. Or you can, um, you can say like, you know, um, you're, you're not, really showing the best side of yourself you know and it's like it's like there's there's so much more that you have to offer you know and that type of thing that that kind of goes longer or further further along than just kind of criticizing you know so i you know going back to your husband to, to i guess the man is that you know being critical doesn't always help but but um but hoping for the best and sometimes communicating that to, to him I think would be would be um, one thing. I would even say too, in addition to that, if there is something that you see that is a is is a good thing that he has, going back to that seed analogy that I talked about, it's find the seed in the culture and try to cultivate that. So if you see those seeds in him, that there are seeds, try to cultivate that. You know, try to encourage him, try to help him see it. You know, and then eventually he'll start to kind of develop it, and eventually he'll he'll lead through that. So I think that that might be a way to do it. Well said. And then for me, um, I, I just love everything he said. And I think seeing the best, like you were saying earlier, the best version of him is so good. And also like for us ladies, like, you know, the culture tells us what beauty is, but our ladies beauty, and I know people say this, but true beauty will like bring out truth and goodness and righteousness from other people. That's like, it draws, it's, that's what it is, you know? So as a wife trying to be like lovely and modest, and I don't just mean physically, but like in the way you are kindness, compassion as a woman, I feel like that's really important to be kind and compassionate and, and, um, lovely. yeah. And you, you kind of reminded me too that, you know, you talked about the cultural aspect, you know, um, just be, I probably encourage anyone who is interested in this specific topic, just to, to be conscious of the cultural norms and expectation and recognizing that we all, we all have that kind of pressure in a sense yeah. you know the men have that pressure to live up to a certain expectation um sometimes that's not helpful you know so tr trying to judge it through a cultural expectation um even though that seems to be the standard um maybe oh, so like 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 an outgoing versus a Sure. So like, you yeah. Just, yeah, he's more introverted so if I was to read a book about an extroverted husband like that wouldn't like 
that wouldn't help me. <laughs> you know, does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So that's not the, quite what you're the, saying. The, but... Well, no, that's a, well, it's kind of like it? that. Okay. But, but just culturally <laughs> speaking, so like this idea of introverted and extroverted. So, um, you know, there's some studies that were, were done and saying like one of the big differences between what they call introverts and extroverts is their reaction to stimulation around them. So if somebody is highly stimulated because of their surrounding, a lot, a lot of people, a lot of noise, they're, they're going to they're gonna tend to want to go in a quiet place, right? Um, whereas if you put an extrovert in a quiet place and that's a little bit maybe too stimulating for them because or maybe lack of stimulation, um, they're going to want to go into a very, you know, loud, people filled place, right? So there's not, I guess my point is just simply what I'm trying to say is that um, there's these culture expectations. So the idea that men must be extroverted, you know, and that's like, be manly. yeah, to be manly, yeah. you know, and I've discovered that like, you know, I'm very manly, yeah. but I'm not a manly in the sense of like being hugely extroverted. Yeah. You know, I do extroverted things, but like primarily, you know, I do manly things in other ways, you know, and recognizing for myself that that's the case. You know, I don't try to measure up to people that like, you know, um, I, I'm just thinking about, I was, I was about to say, his, uh, we saw a movie that he was, and I'm not, I'm not going to call, I'm not, I'm not going to call him what I was about to call him, but uh, Tony Ro Robbins. Oh, oh, right? oh. <laughs> I'm not going to say it. Anyway, so, so Tony Robbins is a great guy, right? And he's like, he's got he's thousands. He's like a life coach speaker, He's a life coach. Like... And he's got thousands of people attending a conference and there's a lot of energy and all these things, right? And then you t you you think, okay, like this guy's like seven feet tall and <laughs> two hundred and fifty pounds. I don't know. Um, and you think, oh wow, like like that's what it is to be a man. I mean, Tony Robbins, if he's listening to this, he's like, okay, probably not. But <laughs> anyway, um, but that's that's a cultural norm, right? There's a cultural expectation, and what I'm trying to say out of all these words is that just to be conscious. Conscious, cautious aware. and conscience aware yeah. <laughs> that sometimes we tend to put people in these cultural norms and expectations and sometimes it's not helpful right because that's just the norm and the standard so um so i'm not sure what the question was anymore but, <laughs> that was but good about the point was said the point was said leadership. yeah oh there you go yeah okay. that was good i think that's important to say that because we as women a lot of times we don't understand and understand their um, temperament and all that okay so uh how do you respond to any negative comments to family size because this person that left the thing said her husband's getting slack at work for being open to life you gotta have tough skin <laughs> you know i i sometimes get that question from my own family you know like my, my parents is like you're pregnant again, you know, and, and it, <laughs> we're it comes, not pregnant right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, just the idea of just, just like, okay, well, you got to take care of all these kids and all these things. Right. Um, so tough skin, one thing, right. And what I mean by tough skin is, is like, um, learning how to, how to manage and how to be tolerant to the things that are going to bother you. Okay. So like these comments, you know, or negative comments at work, you know, and these type of things. So, you can't sometimes prevent those things from happening, um, but but how are you going to navigate your emotional state in life, your psychological state, your spiritual state in life when these burdens are there? Like that's going to be important. Um, secondary burdens being things people are saying. Yeah, burdens. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like things that are like they're criticizing you or they're complaining because of whatever. Um, second, secondarily, I would say that. For me, I am really confident in our family and in in myself. I'm confident in our relationship and our kids. Um, I know they're great kids. I know they've got a lot of things to offer. Um, and we are being salt in the earth. And I'm not trying to be salt. I know we're salt. And, um, to, to, you know, from that perspective, I don't get bothered so much by these comments because I know that I've got something good to offer. And, you know, um, if I get kind of, kind of um, weighed down with all the negative things, I may question the good that we have to offer. And, and I, I tend not to, you know, and I've seen the, I've seen the fruit of how a good life, 
a, a life that is pursuing God and uh, you know living that out in your family influences other people, even people who are who think differently than you. Yeah. On a personal level, you know, I mean, quick quick little story in addition to all these words. Um, <laughs> I love it. Is, <laughs> is I remember when I was in the military and I was sitting down. These are all sailors, right? And then you could tell, like, in this work center, there was a curse word every other two two words. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was it was it was very intense. And I'm sitting across an atheist who's a professed atheist who told me, told me once that atheism is, is like a like chipping away the the ice of the Catholic Church, you know, or, or faith life, you know, slowly kind of chipping away the, 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 the foundation of the church. Anyway, so, you know, someone who didn't like the church, didn't like the faith. And I remember he, his girlfriend got into a car accident and he was really upset. And he's sharing with me his story about his girlfriend getting into a car accident. And I'm just looking at him, you know, kind of nodding my head and just kind of like, just empathizing with him. It's like, oh, you know, that's unfortunate and all that stuff. And he literally just stops what he's saying because he's all revved up with his emotion. And he stops and he looks at me and he says, how can you do that? And I said, what do you mean? He said, how can you just sit there like with a smile on your face? Not a smile, but kind of like, just be be like at calm, peace, yeah. calm. Like be calm. Like how do you how do you do that? You know. And literally, I wasn't doing anything. I was just sitting there listening to him and just empathizing with him. You know, just saying, "Oh, that's kind of unfortunate." You know. But just that itself changed how he viewed that very moment. And I really wasn't trying to do anything. So I guess my point, you don't you you're kind of sharing that story is that you never know. Just living your life, just being loving in your family how that's going to influence those people who really are contrary to you. You know, we almost every time we go out and eat, somebody always comes up and says, you've got such a great family, like your kids are so well behaved, you know, and, and not really throwing, you know, glory to God for, for all the great gifts we've received. But people have paid for our meals sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, because they're just, they're grateful to see a, 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 a family that's sitting together and being a good witness, you know, and we didn't go out doing these things, you know, that's just the way we're living our lives. And, so I guess my point, my overall point, is that don't just don't be shy, don't be afraid to love yourself, love your family, and being be outside in society. You know, let society change. You don't have to worry about its problems. You know, and just kind of just just let your let your lion shine through. I feel like we got to sing a song here or something. Okay, anyway. <laughs> the last question is about a song. Someone just uh-huh. asked me where I got my love for Waylon Jennings because it's uh, Waylon Jennings. It's a play on words for someone else. Anyway, uh, I had a really good friend, Miss April. We're about like the same age, but um, and she loved them and she'd play it while she was cooking. And I was just like, oh, this is the most calming, relaxing. So I usually play Waylon Jennings or Blue Highway. It's my favorite band while I'm cooking. So that's it. Thank you, I got, guys. I got, well, I got to admit to that. <laughs> When I'm sitting down on the couch and I'm watching football or whatever, I hear these songs in the background, whether she's washing dishes or cooking or whatever, <laughs> they're actually creating a memory uh. in me with, with that. Like when I hear the songs, it's like little strings in my heart are being played, you know. Uh. It's, it's kind of funny because it's like, I'm going to start downloading these songs, yeah. you know. But it's, it's just, I, I appreciate them it's too. Good stuff. So, anyway. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all. If you're new to this channel, I'd love for you to subscribe. Give this video a thumbs up. Let us know what you thought. Keep the comments kind, please. And I appreciate all the questions. And hopefully in the future, we can do more videos with Armando here on this channel. So I hope you guys have a great day. God bless. Bye. <laughs>